one of our key program priorities at Muslim Advocates is seeking an end to racial and religious profiling by law enforcement. And so it's, I'm particularly delighted to have this opportunity to speak with all, with all of you this evening. I think with um, the release last week of the Justice Department's report on the Ferguson Police Department and its decision to not indict Officer Wilson, I think this conversation is, is a particularly important and timely one. And let me first say that I certainly believe that there are many officers, men and women in blue, who are serving honorably every day and putting their lives on the line um, to keep our community safe. But what we also know is that there are policies and practices that result in discrimination that erode and have broken the trust that is essential for the police to be able to do their job and keep all of us safe. And we want all of our communities to be safe, whether it's African American men who are stopped and searched or even killed by the police, whether it's Latinos who are simply crossing the border, returning home, who are stopped on suspicion of being undocumented, whether it's a sick American who stopped at the airport simply for wearing a turban, or if you're a Muslim American and you're targeted for surveillance simply because you attend a mosque, we know there's something severely broken with our criminal justice system. For some in our community, in the Muslim community, prior to 9-11, of course, they were already experiencing being stopped while walking, stopped while driving. And so for the African-American component of the Muslim community, they're now getting hit both ways. They're being stopped and frisked, and they have to be, worry about being surveilled for simply going about practicing their faith. And let me just pause, because I think there's sometimes a lot of confusion about who American Muslims are. Um, <laughs> um, a lot of people have a misperception that most Muslims are Arab. Uh, in fact, in the United States, we have a very diverse racial and ethnic um, community. I would argue it's probably the most diverse Muslim community um, in the entire world. Uh, about 30% of the community is African American. Um, the next largest is South Asian, Pakistani, Indian background, followed by Arabs, Malaysians, Indonesians, Somalis, Albanians, Bosnians, you name it. Um, practically every single race and ethnicity is represented in the American Muslim community. So the attacks of September 11th, 2001, it was almost 15 years ago. Uh, but the events of that day, of course, would shape our nation for years to come. And it triggered a law enforcement response that I would argue our nation had not seen before. Law enforcement from the federal government to state and local law enforcement would now start spying on communities and infiltrating our communities simply because of our faith. Initially this was led by the FBI, but it was later adopted by local police, oftentimes using federal funds let me walk you through exactly what I'm talking about. Shortly after 9-11, FBI agents started literally swarming the Muslim, Arab, and South Asian communities throughout the country, knocking on doors at people's homes and their workplaces, oftentimes unannounced, and oftentimes with the pretense of simply wanting to talk what I called so-called voluntary interviews, because the FBI would say, well, these were voluntary interviews. But when you talk to people who actually got contacted by the FBI, they would tell you it was extremely uh, intimidating and coercive, that they felt like when an agent shows up at the door unannounced, discourages them from first talking to a lawyer, it made them feel like they were going to be in trouble. And these incidents are still taking place today. According to one former um, senior level FBI agent, uh, four years after 9-11, so by the end of 2005, close to 500,000 of these interviews had taken place throughout the United States. And yet not a single one of these interviews resulted in information that would have prevented a terrorist attack. 
And just to give you um, an example of, of how prevalent this is today, I actually just got um, a phone call a little over a week ago from um, somebody in the community uh, who is a well-known figure in the community, both here in the United States as well as globally. Um, this person uh, uses his social media account actively, uh, and he speaks out um, against ISIS. He expresses his disgust of ISIS and, and, um, and speaks and condemns terrorism. So two Fridays ago, uh, he suddenly gets a knock at his door at his home. And he opens the door, and lo and behold, there are two FBI agents at his door. Because he had watched our Know Your Rights video, <laughs> he knew to keep standing at the door and to not allow the agents in the house. He then proceeded to ask them, well, officers, um, what's the nature of the visit? They said, you're not in any kind of trouble. We just want to talk. He said, what do you want to talk about? We just want to learn some more about Islam. <laughs> and, and that experience is not unusual. Now, initially, he reacted like a, a lot of people in the community react when they've gotten these knocks on the door. They think, you know, I've done nothing wrong. I've got nothing to hide. But as it sunk in, and he called me two days after this incident occurred, he started thinking, wait a second. You know, the FBI says they're trying to build relationships of trust with the community. But if you're trying to build trust, why are you showing up at my home unannounced? Why wouldn't you call, send me an email? My information is available publicly because I'm on social media so much. <laughs> you can contact me, make an appointment, and then we can talk about your interest in Islam. He was right to be suspicious. Because what we know, based on a Freedom of Information Act request that was filed by the ACLU, is that over these last several years, FBI agents, under the pretext of community outreach, getting to know the community, have been actually documenting these encounters, recording the names, personal information about people, their religious practices, sometimes even their political views, not only documenting them and filing them at the Bureau, but sharing them with the intelligence gathering and the counterterrorism divisions of the Bureau. Even when they're going out into the community and saying, we know your community is the target of hate crimes. We want to help you. We want to encourage you to report hate crimes. Even those contacts are getting filed with the intelligence division of the FBI. So, Think about this. We're almost 15 years after 9-11. And when you've instructed your agents to go out and target a group of people, not based on any evidence of wrongdoing, what do you think is going to happen? Bias is going to slowly seep in. And so about 10 years after 9-11, in 2011, we actually started learning about bigoted training materials that were being used by the FBI, including a document that was made public as a result of the Edward Snowden um, document disclosures, which showed that um, there was a template document that the FBI would use if they wanted to ask the NSA to request data from the NSA. Um, it, this template document basically used a racial slur, Muhammad Raghead, as the template for training for FBI agents. If that's the way our federal government behaves, our nation's top law enforcement agency, imagine what signal that sends to local law enforcement. We need to look no further than the New York Police Department, unfortunately. A, a department that's already been riddled with issues of stop and frisk also faces an issue of the blanket surveillance of American Muslims simply because they're Muslim. But not only in New York. The NYPD was doing this in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Connecticut. They were going into mosques, Muslim-owned businesses, and even college campuses, and particularly targeting Muslim students in the Muslim Student Associations at Penn, Columbia, 
Yale, and the Rutgers New Brunswick and Newark campuses. I actually have um, a short video with me um, that uh, kind of illustrates the scope of what the NYPD um, has been doing and includes uh, the voices of some of the plaintiffs that agreed to join a lawsuit uh, that we filed challenging the, the New York Police Department's conduct. And I'm going to play that for you now. The right to freedom of speech, the right to practice one's religion, to the right to peace of belief. Okay. It is not a legitimate law enforcement purpose in a democratic society to conduct a general program of intelligence against any group. We are a nation of laws. The right to freedom of speech, the right to practice one's religion, to the right to peaceably assemble. These are the rights of all Americans. It's a place of courage. It's a place of what's right and standing up against what's wrong. The thing, again, that makes us the nation that we are is that we play by the rules. People who are entrusted to uh, keep us safe have to play by a certain set of rules. What we've seen with the NYPD is just a blatant disregard for the law. For months, plainclothes officers from the NYPD spied on Islamic centers and businesses, eavesdropping, taking pictures, keeping tabs on Newark's Muslim community. The job of our law enforcement is to make sure that they prevent things. There's no indication the NYPD's intelligence gathering efforts will change. We were very, very shocked. That the NYPD has uh, come to college campuses, spying and recording what we say and what we do, how many times we pray. What they eat, where they pray. To go so far as to enter the um, masjid, our prayer in the uh, Zabedas, where we are trying to worship God, it's the wrong place to be, to be spying. People like shop owners and uh, the imams of the masjids and students like myself uh, were part of the people who were being spied on. Practicing their First Amendment right was being looked at simply because they were Muslim. They were discovered doing these things, and to what degree? Are they still doing it? I just felt like, you know, someone was peering over my shoulder. I stopped going to a particular mosque. I thought it may have negative repercussions on my military career. It's really not a, any longer a, a search for crime. It is really a systematic program of general intelligence about everything that the Muslim community does. That can't happen for no apparent reason. We had to respond to this injustice. We had to. This morning, Muslim advocates filed a lawsuit in federal court on behalf of American Muslims in New Jersey, challenging the New York Police Department's discriminatory and invasive surveillance program. A group of eight American Muslims from New Jersey has filed a federal lawsuit claiming that this morning that New York City's anti-terror efforts go way too far. They're angry and are now filing a lawsuit. The lawsuit that will be filed this morning is intended to take this controversy beyond the rhetoric and into federal court. We are representing a wonderful group of very brave plaintiffs that really represent the full spectrum of Muslims who were spied on. We have African Americans. A citizen who does not want this to stand for what we are. I know we're better than them. It's important that we fight against this to make sure that uh, we're all respected and treated rightly in our society. I believe it was the right thing to do to stand up against this type of behavior. The idea of targeting people based on their religion is really in the, not in the self-interest of anyone, of any tradition here in New York and around the country. 
in America, one of the common values that we share is that you are not to be punished for belonging to a particular race, religion, ethnicity, or gender. When the government is in the business of treating an entire ethnic community as inherently suspect, it licenses people to act in the same way. It encourages racism. It doesn't help bring our country together. That's not acceptable. That's unacceptable. Since public officials with direct oversight responsibility have turned a blind eye towards bigotry, the victims have bravely come forward, turning to the courts as a last resort. This finally stops an egregious act that was happening against us. To have Muslim advocates uh, take this lawsuit against NYPD, um, I feel very proud that there is a group in America that can stand up for our rights. This groundbreaking case is important because this protects all of our rights. I see this case as, as having that sort of historic importance. Today it was surveillance on a mosque. For all we know in the future, it could be surveillance on a church, surveillance on a synagogue. More than anything, we need to work together because the rights of one person have effect on the rights of all. I think Muslim advocates and other civil rights organizations are what's great about America. Rights don't vindicate themselves. They're like muscles. And unless you flex the muscles, you start getting atrophy. What the Muslim advocates is doing is flexing those muscles. This lawsuit, titled Hassan et al. versus the City of New York, is perhaps the most important legal challenge to date brought by the American Muslim community to protect their rights and our nation's founding values. There are not different constitutions for different groups of people depending on their religion or their skin color. It's just uh, one group of people called American citizens. This is a great, great country, what I'm saying to all of us. I'm still American, always will be, and American is, uh, that's my heritage, that's all that I know. Uh, America is a place for everyone to participate and have their freedom. Uh, we need to uphold that. We can't stop now. We cannot stop now. Hopefully your support and Muslim advocates' work will help bring us to a better future for a right and just America. We're in this together. All of us are in this together. What we are doing has a profound ramification on the whole country. A better life for not just Muslims, but for all of our children and for the future generations. That's what we do. Let us try to work together to create a better world. I just want to underscore the immense um, courage, and, and frankly, it's been a privilege to work with the plaintiffs in our case. You saw three of them, Moiz Muhammad, Farhaj Hassan, Imam Abdul Karim. If you can imagine, it's not an easy thing to be involved in a lawsuit, and particularly a lawsuit that takes on the nation's largest police department and one of the largest in the world. Um, so my immense, immense gratitude to them. Um, Several months after we filed our lawsuit, we were joined as um, by the Center for Constitutional Rights, uh, who joined us as co-counsel. They're the lead um, group that um, successfully fought the NYPD stop and frisk uh, policies. Um, just to give you a quick update, um, the lawsuit was uh, dismissed by the lower courts, the district court. We filed an appeal uh, last summer. Uh, this January, we heard oral arguments uh, in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. We're expecting a decision sometime this year. Um, our legal team is feeling cautiously optimistic that we got a fair and a full hearing from the judges, and, and we're cautiously optimistic we're going to get a ruling in our favor. I, I did want to take a moment to thank um, Chief Burbank. Um, he was uh, one of the voices who actually joined uh, an amicus brief, or friend of the court brief, when we filed the appeal, and bringing a voice of the law enforcement community to say that biased policing is bad policing. And so my, my immense gratitude to Chief Burbank for his leadership on these issues. So as we can see, time and time again, um, whether it's the death of Michael Brown, P. 
people being stopped at the borders and in our airports or the surveillance of our communities, uh, our, our system is broken and it badly needs repair. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. I look forward to the conversation. And um, in addition to my Twitter uh, handle, I also encourage you to follow us at Muslim Advocates to stay, um, stay current on our work, uh, as well as follow us on our Facebook page and visit our website at muslimadvocates.org. So thank you so much.